First question I want to ask uh, before we get into introductions, just to kind of give me uh, uh, feedback on who you guys are. How many of you guys are career authors or hope to be career authors? Meaning you, that is your primary or a major source of income. Show of hands, please. Okay, how many are hobby authors? Okay, so you're more or less on the artist side of things and the business side. So, um, good, good, good. I'm going to let our panelists do their introductions, and then I'll do mine, and we'll get those things started. Oh, great. I get to go first. Uh, I'm Jim Nettles. I am, by, by trade, I do business and technology consulting work. I'm also a science fiction and fantasy author. I am also a nonfiction author. Uh, I have a current project, for those of you who are interested, that is about the business of being an author. You know, uh, so please feel free to come by and get cards. Uh, I also write fiction under James P. McDonald and a couple of other names as well. I am Tara Burton. I work at Kennesaw State University as a marketing professor. I teach uh, social media, but I also wrote a book called Socially Engaged, The Author's Guide to Social Media with Jenna Oliver. Uh, my name is Mallory Whitfield. My niche is working with handmade artists. I started my own handmade business in 2004. And I kind of taught myself all about social media marketing. And then for the last uh, four years or so, I've worked by day in social media, digital marketing as well. And I, my book is about how to make money at craft shows. So it's a very specific niche. Hi, I'm Gail C. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, and steampunk, mostly for Solaris books and Orbit books. And uh, coming next year, Warhammer. The new book there is Scourge, uh, first book in the Darkhurst epic fantasy series for Solaris. On the other side of my life, I have an MBA in marketing. I spent 17 years running corporate marketing departments. I've written six books on social media marketing. Um, my previous book, 30 Days to Social Media Success, made life hacks list of top 20 business books to read in 2016. And the brand new book, The Essential Social Media Marketing, which I happen to have a couple of copies up here for sale, just came out in May from Career Press. And it's all about why the stuff you did on, the, on social media last year worked and why it doesn't now and what to do about it. And lastly, my name is Sasha Ilyevich, and I have been writing romance for almost 20 years now, published for as long, with a variety of subgenres, including contemporary, paranormal, more adult-oriented, things like that. And that's pretty much what I'm doing right now, aside from teaching classes to writers, not on social media of all things, I'm actually teaching on um, craft. So there's that. Um, you want to start defining some of the terms. Like, uh, well, niche, what is niche marketing exactly? Niche marketing means you're not sending out a shotgun blast or throwing a large bowl of spaghetti against a big wall to see what sticks. In other words, you are thinking carefully about who your most likely ideal customer is. And that might be somebody who reads your genre. That might be somebody who likes to play your kind of game. Whatever the person that would be your ideal buyer. And then you look at where do they hang out online? Who do they follow? What kind of groups are they part of? What kind of content are they consuming? And you find ways to provide and leverage <laughs> and connect with those groups and, and influencers and areas and content so that you're going where your most likely ideal buyer is instead of just throwing it all up in the air and hoping that if millions of people see your ad, the 100,000 people who might be interested or the 10,000 people will somehow pick it out of the noise and static. I always hate it when people say, you know, anybody could read my book. And I'm like, no, no. 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 And it's very much like we can tar consider target marketing be when you break that big group up into small groups. But niche marketing gets even smaller. You're the perfect example of what we're talking about today with her focusing on marketing at craft shows. Because that's very, very targeted. So that's definitely niche marketing. Yeah, if she'd have just yeah. titled this How to Make Money, yeah. that's not targeted. And it probably wouldn't be as successful because there are a gazillion books out there. Yeah, well, and for me, one of the things is, um, so since this book is targeted at crafters, I, the first place I actually sold this book was on Etsy as a digital download PDF. Absolutely. And then I later evolved it and figured out how to turn it into a Kindle book and then a print book via CreateSpace on Amazon. 
so it really started with the the people that I was trying to sell it to in mind as far as like where I went first to sell it. And if you took it to craft shows and sold it off your table at craft shows or sold it at the shows where crafters buy their raw materials, that's niche marketing. Yeah, and I um, last spring I actually spoke at a conference called Craftcation that's for crafters oh, wow. mm. and so I was able to do book signings there it's a super super targeted market it's a smaller convention it's 400 people versus you know Dragon Con but they're <laughs> all the people that are exactly the right audience for me and the other thing about building your niche is understanding who who your customer really is <clears throat> if you're doing something like this with you know I'm, I'm built writing a book I'm building a product for crafters you've already defined and know who your niche is but if you're working on something you're not sure exactly who your target customer is, you need to go and look and figure that out and build that, that ideal avatar. Build that fake customer. Who is my ideal person I'm going to go target? And that is going to be the guy you sit there and have, or the, the person you sit there and have a conversation with about what is it you want to see or do? What would attract you to my product? And that doesn't, we're not trying to limit you. What we're trying to do is give you a very solid foothold and platform. Now, once you own that niche, once you are the go-to person for how to make money craft books on craft, maybe her second book is how to make money making handmade jewelry or how to make money. She can expand to related other niches. It's kind of like buying a house and then buying the house next door and buying the house on the other side until you own the whole street but you start with the first house. And so it, don't think of it as limiting you or make, giving you a small audience. Uh, it's where you get a solid foothold and, and a claim of expertise, and then you can grow that to all the adjacent interests that um, bump out next door. It's why there's six zillion flavors of ruffles. Yeah. Except that uh, biscuits and gravy, I heard it wasn't that good. Yeah, and I'm, I'm still not loving on ketchup either, you know, really. <laughs> so, now we've got these two terms defined. One of the things I want to ask you guys, because I've been doing this for, a, for a, like I said, almost 20 years, and what I'm noticing in the industry is that a lot of the stuff that I'm being told to do now is the sort of stuff that I was told to do 18 years ago, but the results I'm getting are a little mixed because I've spent more time with my head down hands on the keyboard writing as opposed to learning how to market. That's what I have these fun friends for. Um, what would you say would be the best thing to start doing with targeting? And how do you, how do you really get into that? Well, it's going to depend on who your target audience is as to what tactics you use. Well, I think, I think one place to start is an easy way is what do what does your target audience like to do? What do they like to read? And where are they going to find those things? So find the influencers in your target audience. Those may be best-selling authors of the kind of genre you want to write. Those might be the people who are uh, creating the best-selling games. Um, that might be the magazine that everybody who's interested in this reads. And one tactic is to um, invite the people who are following them to follow you or add them as followers like on Twitter. Um, but at the least, start retweeting their content, start commenting, start um, connecting at a place where your people are already gathering. And if you do it well and you're not combative and you've got content that, that adds value, those people will start following you to your digital home. Well, and those contributions, y you know, you need to contribute. It's not about me, 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 me. It's, it has to be I'm contributing, I'm participating, I'm, I'm building part of the bigger community. Not look at me, look at me, look at me, Lee. You know, it is, hi, I'm here, I'm here to help, I'm here to contribute, I'm here to be whatever, but it's like anything else with any other community. You have to be a participant, you have to be a contributor, you have to be there for the rest of the community, and the community will then come and help you. And don't be afraid to think that because the people you are targeting are nowhere in your current sphere, <clears throat> that you can't talk to them or help them out somehow. I routinely retweet Tim Ferriss um, from the four hour work week. 
because I think a lot of what he has to say is good for authors in general because we all, car all are kind of a little neurotic. And him talking a about little. that, well, I mean, you've seen me on the panels. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years. Um, and I think it just helps him because it does get that to a larger audience. So I'm more than happy to go push his content on Twitter and to some extent, depending on what he's putting on, a vision like Yanni from Mind Valley, also same thing on Facebook. We tweet his posts because of what he's trying to do and how that helps the author community. And you'd be amazed at how many of those people notice when you are consistently signal boosting for them and they pay attention and if they're not total assholes, they thank you for it. I get a lot of respect from the cigar community because I push their stuff on uh, uh, Instagram. Give first. You know, don't be completely reckoning ROI on this. If you love this topic, share about it. And people will start respecting you as the connector and the person who uh, curates the information and provides value. So if you're going out and looking at all these feeds that interest your audience and sharing the best of it, people start following you because they don't have time to follow all those feeds and look for the good stuff. They'll come over and be lazy and read your feed and now you also have a chance to slip in some tweets or some posts about what you're doing. And you can automate a lot of that uh, via different platforms on uh, what Hootsuite and... Um, Social Oomph. Oh, okay, yeah. Tweet, so. Is TweetDeck still around? TweetDeck is, um, and you can Crowdfire has yeah. sort of gone through some changes that are... One thing spell. I have found is that Hootsuite allows you to program tweets with um, media attached, so photos or video, with which Social Oomph does not, yeah. and your tweets are much... Uh, higher visibility when you've got a photo or a video with them. Yeah, we did cover that. I, I was talking about this on Friday. We had as a course I took uh, on Facebook, in particular, how to really truly use your fan page. Because as far as I'm understanding and considering at this point, I don't think blogging is still relevant anymore. But you guys tell me. I think blogging. And is then still I'll spin relevant. back around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think blogging is still relevant because it's an easy way to create content that you can then push out on multiple media channels as well as curate it easily and help your SEO, your website stay recent. So I, I still endorse blogging very much so because of that. I think it's evolved. Um, some of the ways that when I started blogging in 2006, I used to do shorter content with a picture and now that kind of stuff I'll actually use on Instagram instead. I tend to use really long Instagram captions with a photo in the way that I would have done a blog post 10 years ago. But now for my blog, I don't post every day. I probably post something new once every few months, if that. But I go for really, really long, in-depth content because I actually specialize in search engine optimization. And posts that are more than 2,000 words are going to be much more likely to get links back to your website, which is what you want in terms of getting visible in Google and other search engines. So I go for content that's going to be relevant for a really long time and that I can keep sharing over and over and over again instead of something that's going to be one and done and not interesting after so tomorrow. And I do... Well, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I do three big blogging campaigns a year. Um, I don't blog every day. I write eight books a year, okay? That's where a lot of my juice goes. Uh, I, I just don't have anything that exciting to say every day. But I do three major blog tours every year. My Hawthorne Moon uh, tour hits the summer solstice. I'm usually on 30 to 40 international blogs in a week um, talking about different uh, things that are tangentially related to my new book. I do the Days of the Dead tour in the last week of October because I write about necromancers and vampires and, and things that go bump in the night. And again, another 20 to 40 international blogs hosting me, talking about things that have to do with the supernatural. And then I'm the founder for the Hold On to the Light blogging campaign with authors uh, blogging about mental wellness issues to stand in solidarity with fans and reduce stigma and in promote inclusiveness. That hits in September and October as well because there are a lot of mental health uh, days. So that's very targeted niche blog use, it's not an everyday build my platform, which can work really well for you. You know, like if you're doing recipes, if you're doing how-to, that kind of stuff is, is wonderful. 
I just don't have the juice to do it every day, so I do it in three big clusters. And that makes a total and bunch of sense. I have the same problem. Which are you. not clusters, just to, just to you know. And, and right. the, the other <laughs> side with your blog post, so I, I, because I have several um, and generate content for a couple of other people as well. Uh, when you're going out and doing content, it's got to be something, if you're going to invest the time to generate content, it needs to be something that is engaging, it's meaningful, you're not just out there doing something every day, every week, every month just to generate content, it needs to be something that has purpose. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and, you're, and you know, the readers are going to come and go and say, mm, BS, I'm not coming back. Because you have to spend a lot of time to bring people to your platform. So it's better to spend, if you're going to spend the time do something that is meaningful. I, you know, on my personal blog as an author, every, you know, I do a fair number of blog tours and I will do stuff like I will publish small short stories that are seasonal or that tie into a blog tour. I'll write an article or something along those lines, but I'm, I'm doing something that's meaningful there. Now on the, the business side, I try to get something out about three weeks out of four, um, but with you know multiple intent. So if you're doing the blog post, do something that somebody a SEO is going to pick up, search engine op optimization is going to pick up, or b something that's going to give a reason for your fans, your readers, everybody else to come back to. And that could be as simple as serializing you know, your current work in progress. Doesn't have to be edited. Doesn't have to be anything else. But it's a way of both publishing content and bringing people to you and help building that fan base. I tend to bring my my unedited. <coughs> excuse me. My unedited work goes to my Patreon because people are literally paying me every month to well support me as a writer, and that got a lot of stigma a couple of years ago. There was a big backlash about writers that were doing that uh, using Patreon as a source. Have you guys seen any of that? Um, yeah, all right, so I'll I'll put this out there. Uh, we all are uh, frequently a lot of us have a problem with money as a stigma. You know, there, we have that money story. We have that thing where we're afraid to ask for money be, for, for value because we're questioning what the value is of the worth of what we're doing. I am a shameless, shameless business guy. I will take the money. I'm not as bad as John Harkness, but I'm close. I would um, five bucks anyway. Um, but as writers, it is hard to make a living. It's hard to make a living, period. We, we have to be ready and willing to go out there and say, I've done something of value. I have invested a lot of time. Frequently, I've invested also a lot of money. And we also all have to make a living. I mean, the, the amount of time that I see stuff posted about, oh my God, somebody wants to charge three ninety nine for a book, four ninety nine for a book, while they're sucking down Starbucks. I'll look at them and go, you're not my reader. At the same time, you know, as we go through these things, this is true not just of us as authors. This is true of us generally in business. Um, you know, because I do a lot of consulting for for different industries as people who provide high value services that are afraid to say, "Pay me for what I do." And right now, we see a lot of challenges. You know, the freebies on Kindle and everybody going, "Oh, I'm giving it away, giving it away." Okay, that's great. You know, what are you, why are you doing that? If you're going to do these things, you if you're going to make a living at this, if you're doing this even as a hobby, but you want to at least recoup your investment, because if you're putting out a quality product, you're going to have to invest time and capital to make it happen. You are, you know, you also should expect to find a way to recoup it. And Amazon is trying to do things in such a way that they're driving down what we can make. Yeah, and it's, it makes no sense to me. I just uh, was at a stock seminar I was talking about a couple days ago, and they made us read through some of the financials. Amazon's not making any money. I mean, they're not really pocketing anything. But you can do that when you're them and still work things to your advantage. It does not work on a personal Just because no. you can do it on an institutional <laughs> level when you're Amazon doesn't mean you can do it on a personal level. Well, coming back to what you said about Patreon, it depends on whether people perceive your Patreon as a handout, the equivalent of the busker on the street with the guitar case open hoping for some, some bucks. And even then, I think you're paying for a service because I love to listen to street musicians and I'm glad to, to pay them for the five minutes of happiness they gave me. Um, I don't see it as charity. But, you know, many of the people I know who have successful Patreons have set it up where it's not a you know, help me, I'm a starving writer, toss me money so I can pay my electric bill. It's, 
this is a subscription service where you are buying benefits for your five bucks a month, your seven bucks a month, your premium ten bucks a month. This means you get my what my indie works first. This means you get extra content nobody else gets. This means you get access to me nobody else gets. That's selling a VIP suite that you are the host of in the same way that they sell a concierge level at the hotel and they sell VIP boxes at the stadium. That is giving access to you in a VIP manner. There's nothing to be ashamed of. That's not a handout. That is giving value for a set contribution and they are paying a subscription just like they are for a magazine or for Netflix or for Crunchyroll. No shame in that. You just have to have the audience base, I think, before you can do it. I mean, you have to have built the ground uh, ground level up, and that's who I've seen be successful with Patreon is those yeah. who already had a following. Uh, one of my friends who used to write for um, White Wolf, he has a mm -hmm. wonderful Patreon, and the reason is because he has such a following, and he gives them content that's unique and special to them. So, And that's going to happen in two ways. Either you are so big you have a following, or, or well established enough to have a following. Or what you are providing is so completely unique that until other competitors hedge you in, people are very willing to pay for, pay extra for access because nobody else is doing this. Yeah. And that first mover advantage won't last forever, but it can put you ahead of the pack for a long time. Yeah. It's not a bad place to start looking into things in general, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, we've seen things, uh, you know, there's a very big difference between, for example, Patreon and and providing that service and people that do Patreon or I'm going to go do a Kickstarter for something and say, I, I, I really want to publish my first book and, you know, give me $10,000 to do my cover. If you're coming out and you don't have a plan and you're just begging, mm -hmm. that doesn't work anymore. Well, and Kickstarter can be a fantastic marketing tool, but um, it, it is not an easy thing to do well. I've been part of some very, very successful Kickstarters. I was part of the Athena's Daughters anthology um, that was Kickstarted. We asked for $8,900. We got 44000 At the time and for a long time thereafter, we were the most successful literary project on Kickstarter. We're still one of the top ones, and the... Um, the editor for that project, Ron Garner, was asked by Kickstarter to come down to their Washington office and talk to them about how to do this. Uh, Kickstarter invites you to come talk to them about how you did your Kickstarter. It's pretty good. Um, but a good Kickstarter takes work. A good Kickstarter takes some monetary investment to have a, a kick-ass video. It takes a lot of elbow grease. It takes a group commitment. So yes, that is a, another marketing tool, but it probably should not be your very first tool if nobody knows you for doing anything yet. Definitely not. Uh, I would use it definitely in conjunction mm -hmm. with as you build your audience. One of the things that I've been slowly finding success with, and I do mean slowly right now because I am taking my time in this, is vlogging on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So every week my readers know, or anyone who's paying attention to me for that matter knows, every Wednesday, YouTube video. <clears throat> As of late, it's been randomness, but a lot of times I will give tips out to authors new and established because that's what happened when I was first in the industry. Is these people like these up here had said, "Hey, you want to do this? Here's how you do this," and just start pointing me in the right direction. So. Well, and um, one more thing about Kickstarter: it's not a great idea if it's your first book or you're not known for anything yet to try to do your own Kickstarter for a novel. But if someone were to invite you to be part of an anthology with a lot of better known authors, that can be a really terrific marketing tool for you because if everybody is promoting the Kickstarter and your name is getting mentioned along with these best selling authors, then you're kind of getting carried along with that tide and you're being exposed to a much larger group of niche readers. I love the fact that this just gave me a segue. I was going to ask about box sets and targeted marketing because one of the other things that I'm seeing in professional publishing is the box set with the intention of literally going after your New York Times bestselling author status or your USA Today bestselling status. Um, I, I've actually seen them decrease is what I've been seeing is that it was kind of one of those waves that people rode and they really were great and they were hitting the top of, 
of list, and it seems now that they're not doing that anymore. The market's kind of got saturated in them. It's not just that the market got saturated. It was working, and so the market rigged it. So BookBub will not promote boxed sets of multi-author, multi-author box sets anymore. Um, that had been a big component in some of the original very, very successful ones. The New York Times quit including multi-author box sets in their main list. So, you know, when they change the game on you right. because you're winning too much, <laughs> there's a problem here. Um, I was part of the Modern Magic box set last year, and we ran uh, for about five months. We had 12 authors with 12 full-length novels, uh, all urban fantasy. About half of those people were New York Times or USA Today uh, national bestsellers, uh, and most of the rest of us were at least, you know, Kindle uh, number one bestsellers in our genre, um, and and that was for ninety nine cents. We um, we did not get New York Times with it because they had changed their rules by then. What we did do, and this is what we wanted out of it, not only did we make a profit and recoup certainly all of our costs, um, we did a lot of behind the scenes marketing with pages like Promo Cave and. Um, uh, e-reader daily and, and a number of those sites but we got also reds so all of us were starting to pop up on each other's Amazon if you like this you might like that so we were again very niche target audience I because we selected the people to be in that box set of who has a complementary audience profile but not too similar and so everybody came away very happy because we got a lot of the also bots, we got a lot of increased visibility, we made all our money back and then some. Um, nobody got rich off of it, but we, we achieved what we wanted out of it. That, that was in the experience that some of my writer friends have had, is that there was so much time invested that they definitely made money back and they did make a profit, mm -hmm. but the time that they had to spend investing in that box set was not necessarily worth what they got out of it now versus a year ago. Well, and the ones that I'm hearing that have still, there was a uh, 21 author box set that I oh. think was either urban fantasy or paranormal romance that launched just a little bit before that. And we were looking at them going, okay, they're cleaning our clock with this. How were they doing it? Well, one of our authors happened to know one of their authors and found out that they had each kicked in mm -hmm. Two or three thousand dollars at least. Okay, if you put that kind of money behind anything and you're not a total idiot, you're going to see more results than we all kicked in, you know, much, uh, you know, a couple hundred a piece. Right. Yeah, that's what we're doing. There's actually a newsletter uh, site called I Love Vampire Novels. They got a box set thing going on. It's a $250, $250 buy in, and then they're requesting. Or requiring you to not only have finished a full-length paranormal romance novel, but also spend another two hundred fifty dollars on that out of your own pocket because they're dropping four grand and keeping it to twenty authors, and so we have a total of about nine to ten grand. That should make a profit. I don't. I, none of us care with the letters. Well, on the box, to my knowledge. <coughs> so, but there's got to be ways to do this sort of stuff for those who are not able to spend. The kind of cash I was on a shoestring budget for a long time. How do we, how do we do this now with that? Well, when you're if you're operating and doing it without a lot of cash, you expect to spend a lot more time. Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, time is a resource. It, it is a limited resource, just like money. Um, when you know when you're talking tech, and when you're talking projects, things like this, when you're talking business, you've got the Aaron Triangle. You got three sides: time, quality, and money. And you you can never, you know, ping to all three. So I if you don't have the capital to pour into it, then expect to spend a lot more time doing it, going out to where your potential readers would be. And again, we're back into engaging and becoming part of a community and having the community lift you up. But expect to, you know, take a lot more time. If you have, if you have the capital to spend at it and capital to throw at it, then you can escalate a lot more quickly. I mean, this is why we, we have TV, because advertisers support the crap that gets thrown on that little square box. Yeah. When you mentioned vlogging, I think another thing yes. is podcasting, yep. too. 
Um, I started my own podcast earlier this summer, but then I've also been on other people's podcasts. And within any niche, there's going to be podcasts. And even if you don't want to invest in starting your own, you can start pitching to other people who have similar audiences as yours, get on their show. There's something about actually hearing somebody's voice to connect you more with that author, who, whoever that artist is. So that's another option. And if you don't know where to find these, try Googling fantasy book podcast or gaming book podcast or whatever your niche is. Go out to sites like Blog Talk Radio and look for the category for whatever it is you do. And then come up with a, a pitch and start pitching the producers. You know, you are focused on what you need, which is you need visibility. You would really like to be a guest on this podcast or a guest on this blog. You know what? On the other side of that, there are people running these blogs and podcasts going, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to write about next Tuesday. So they're very happy to have guests because it takes some of the pressure off of them, and they become the provider of cool content and the discoverer of new talent. And it, they don't have to write something on Tuesday if you're the guest. It makes me stoked to do that. When I had a podcast years ago, I had, I had authors up there, and they'd send me their information. I'd just slap it up there instead of having to come up with new content. It was great. Well, and that's one thing that um, I had a friend who put out a book under a pseudonym to see how social media actually worked. And what we found out is even with high-quality content, even with money, without networking, you could not get a base. So if you're not talking to the people you're sitting next to at panels, I know that a lot of writers or introverts try to step out and talk to the people sitting next to you because they very well may be part of your audience or have a friend that's in the community of the audience. Podcasting community is an amazing community that I have never found them not to help and welcome the next person. Authors, if you're a writer, go find writer networks and writing groups within your city. It's a bunch of introverts who try to talk to each other. It's fabulous. Um, because I think and sometimes hysterical to watch yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> my favorite is still being at a romance writers conference in Houston the bar is crowded with women who don't know if they want to talk to each other and two guys holding beers walking in going oh my god what do we do that was me actually uh, last <laughs> this past year at, at RT when they were here I walked in there and I mean I, I've been yep. like I said I'm in the same genre but there is a reason why after doing full days of panels at this con most of us were still in the bar until the wee hours every night. And I'm talking, you know, if you looked around, there were New York Times bestsellers, there were USA Today bestsellers, there were all kinds of bestsellers, and we're all sitting there doing deals and talking and catching up on the scoop and finding out which editor left which house and what's going on. That's why we are sleep deprived, because it's part of the business. Yep. Well, and there was good alcohol. <laughs> Most important reason, of course. Which yeah. helps with the introvert a lot. It, it, it actually, one of the things, I'll tell a short version of the story. I was at a, um, RWA is in June or July? Yes. Okay, RWA in San Francisco. And I had been watching the authors, the, the, the newer breed of authors, the newer, younger ones, sit there and go through and do things they should not be doing. And watching them put down four or five or six of these big drinks and then start talking about mess about particular authors and editors, and I just shook my head. But it was interesting to watch. So, can we yeah. talk about video for a second? Because mm -hmm. yeah. I, I I know you're in SEO too. Video is just huge. Google is owns, as we all know, owns YouTube, but they're working on that search engine. Facebook is working on tagging and categorizing the Facebook lives that are going out. So I, if you don't mind being on camera, you can find some way to create content that is video with you in the background talking. Um, I encourage it because I well, think that's another great way. Well, and, and I mean, one of the things to remember that, that's worthwhile, we're talking here about social media. Social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, you know, all these different companies don't exist for your benefit and purely for your entertainment. They are businesses, and they are, you know, their business is geared on advertising their business is geared on people their business is geared towards making sure that we have content to provide that we don't have to generate but we can sell advertising to those people they are data collection services and when you go to look to advertise on them you can see exactly how much data gets collected about you so you can learn how to use social media 
but also learn how social media is using you as a part of this exercise. Well, and the other thing to yeah. remember with video is there, there are a lot of folks um, who are saying that they really think by 2020 um, the majority of content on social media will be video. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook gives preference to video over text and, and pictures. So if you want a post to have more, have larger organic reach, do video because Facebook generally suppresses the organic reach of other types of posts because they, they want you to pay up. Now the key here is Facebook sees Google as a competitor. So if you just put a, a video up on Google and then post the Google link, Facebook will suppress it because, oh my God, that's, a, that's the enemy. But if you film, if you do the video with your camera and do either do Facebook Live or use your cell phone video camera and then upload it to Facebook, you can use that same video and upload it to YouTube, but by uploading it direct to Facebook, then it is native video and they will actually boost your post for you, at least right now with the, the way the algorithm is going. The other thing I'd recommend, and you can do this really easily right in, in um, YouTube's editor, is always do captions. Because a lot of people who are at work or doing this in a public place aren't going to have the audio on. So if you've got a video there, they just see your mouth move, but they get no content out of it. If you've got, closed, if you've got the captioning on, A, you've done a service to everybody who's hearing impaired. B, people can get the gist of your video without having to turn the audio on, and it's super, super easy to do. And secondly, that uh, caption, closed captioning, mm -hmm. is uh, searchable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another another thing for YouTube as well, if you want people to find you within the YouTube search engine, is creating custom thumbnails. Um, that's like a really simple, big one that a lot of people don't, don't pay attention to, but especially if it's just you, a talking head, you with a little bit of text about what that video is going to be of is going to catch somebody's eye much better than just you as the person with a plain background behind you. Canva is a really great uh, free great. graphic design tool that's browser based. You don't have to install any software and they have a template for YouTube thumbnails. It's really Caveat simple. to the YouTube thumbnail, if you do not design your own thumbnail, they will randomly pick some ridiculous pose of yours and that will be the video. Yeah, but Canva is super easy to use. Yeah, yeah. You can even like upload, if you went on vacation someplace with like a nice beach in the background, you can upload your photo and use it as a background. Um, so it's super, super easy. C-A-N-V-A. And I don't, I'm not advocating this uh, during this time of day, but there are uh, some people that will use uh, dirty <coughs> thumbnail images to draw in views. And there's no actual content at all. It's all it's all random, whatever it is. But they'll put something at the little risque, and don't. I was told not to do that too much, but every once in a blue moon, and these guys will have a different opinion, obviously. But this is coming from Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know I'm butchering his name, but. Um, you know, people will get really pissed at you if you do bait and switch. You know, this is kind of yeah, like yeah. in the really old days of when when websites were first new. One of the big things was to put Lactic. transparent text at the bottom that was like white on white so it wasn't visible to the human eye but it was bot searchable and to put all these dirty words in so that you know all the porn filters would find you and then they get there and and they get to a blog post about how to make money at craft fairs and they're reasonably pissed off because you you did false advertising um Google not, will get you for yes. it. Yeah. It, it. That's the end of the day. It, whenever you try to circumvent Google, Google will eventually stab you in the heart. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way that works. And that's when they're nice. Mm -hmm. True. Not to mention there's Facebook jail too. But. You guys want to do some Q&A? Sure. Are you awake yeah. enough to do Q&A? Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody see? Spending two or three thousand dollars together and then increasing their sales. Like, how did they spend that money? Then, like, how did they use the money to go through and get extra? My sales? understanding is that that was that was invested into like Facebook ads, Twitter ads, um, and the hundreds of sites out there that for anywhere from fifteen dollars to three hundred and fifty to a thousand will do different things to expose your content to their readers or run ads. There's no shortage of places to spend the money. Um, it's just 
do you want to throw that kind of money at it? That's really, at, to an extent, even well targeted. There's still a little bit of gambling involved there. Oh, there's because a, you know that's that's kind of play in the lottery. So you have to have the two or three thousand that you don't mind losing, because it may not work out that way. Well, see, librarian didn't do well for me, but the like I said earlier, I love vampire novels. Did tweet your book did really well for me, dropping numbers in July. So it, it, it is a it is a bit of a gamble. Well, and think about your niche market. So let's say you're writing ghost stories or books with ghosts. There are tons of ghost hunting sites out there. If you can find one that has advertising that seems to have a very similar audience to yours, that might be a good place to throw fifteen, twenty dollars and see what happens. And a lot of social media and a lot of advertising is what I call A-B testing. Always be testing. Try something, measure it, see if it works. If it didn't, figure out what you did wrong or what you need to do better. And I do that from everything from ads that I design to post. I'll figure out, do videos work better now or solid images? Where do I put links in a tweet? Do I put them at the beginning, the middle, or the end? I'll test it. Every single time I'll test it and see what works better. And, and you know, 50 bucks or 100 bucks thrown at an ad in front of your ideal audience yeah. is going to get you much more than, you know, thrown out there randomly. But, you know, again, to kind of play off what you said, look for the unusual market. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you write ghost stories, for example, and you are, or you're writing a series with a very strong tie to a particular locale, start hitting up not only the local bookstores in that area, but the museum gift shops and the craft shops, because people like, that then becomes a souvenir for some people if they went on vacation there and, oh look, here's a murder mystery set in Myrtle Beach. Um, you know, you can, you can, I bought one of those. Where somebody's I killing? There. <laughs> um, you know, that, that kind of thing can be very successful. Um, there's a guy who, and I'm blanking on his name right now, he wrote, he was talking about self-publishing long before it became acceptable or trendy. And he's written the kind of the Bible on how to self-publish. Pointer? Um, pardon? Dan Pointer. Dan Pointer. He got his start because he wanted to write a, he's an avid parachuter, he wanted to write a book on parachuting, and he couldn't get it published. So he published his own book, and this was like back in the 90s. It was before this was cool to self-publish. And he went around, he, thought, he said, where do parachuters go? Well, they hang out at sporting goods stores. So he schlepped his book to every sporting goods store he could find, and they would take a small stack of them. And it, it, it continues to be a super bestseller because he reached his audience. Okay, that's elbow grease and shameless promotion, but it worked. Gail Martin is hitting on a very excellent niche for books. Uh, bookstores have the historically been 100% returnable. That's create space doesn't do that, and that's why you don't see them in the bookstores. But these other things like museums, uh, craft shops, local history places, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they treat it as regular merchandise. They don't return the books. Yep. Uh, that's a very, very valuable niche. Which means they have more invested in selling it because they paid for it. Unless you sell it to them on consignment, try to avoid doing that. Then it's returnable again, or it'll just sit there and gather dust because it's no skin off their nose. So I raised my hand for a hobby writer because I'm actually like a very kick-ass project accountant and I enjoy doing it and I don't want to give up my day job. But because of that beautiful white collar day job, which I'm very grateful that I have and that I love doing, not a lot of people can say that, I do have good disposable income. And so we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one thing. Like, I, I would buy all these books that I wasn't even sure if I was going to like them. And I'm like, am I wasting my money on this? And one day I went, no, no, this is how I support the arts. If I don't like this book, I'll give it to the library. But um, I, <laughs> you know, um, I, I think I still would really, I'm really proud of the, the book that I've written and the trilogy that I'm writing. I'm going to take my time. I'm not out to make a lot of money as a writer. But on the other hand, I don't want to um, throw the spaghetti on the wall. So it's like I don't, just because I do have the, the privilege of being able to spend money, I don't want to just like be, try everything. 
I want to try, you know, the right things to start with. So I'm a little bit overwhelmed about, I'm just starting to learn about the Facebook ads and like the, the everything. So if you have the freedom of choice, where do you guys recommend that I start? Use your <laughs> audio good place. Well, first of all, buy Gail's book. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yes, there, there's your shameless. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, so uh, the next part is it depends on what niche you're in. Um, because depending on what niche you're in will determine sort of the platform and where your audience is. Facebook is now a trending older. Um, Facebook ads are a sort of declining value in, certain, in a lot of ways, but there's still value there. Um, you know, if you are, you know, if you're writing a book for teenage girls, then you're going to Instagram. If you're writing books, you know, about, uh, Twitter is still a lot more productive. So there's a certain degree of not only targeting your audience on the platform, it's targeting your platform based on your audience. And the, the first thing I'll tell you to do is build a website. Yes. And get your space on the web um, where you have a home and where you can direct people for inbound because that's all you own. Um, so focus on that. And I also tell people start with one platform and then move to the next. And so. Even if you're writing YA, and probably Instagram or Tumblr might be more uh, appropriate, or if you're young as well, you, Snapchat would work as well. But I always tell people, probably also have a Facebook presence just because it's like the white pages for everybody. You know, two billion people can't be wrong and go there once a day. So um, No, two billion still can be wrong. They just go there once a day. I, I, have, <laughs> I have really great success on Facebook, so uh, I, I would give them props. But um, make sure you have that home first. Get your URL, that's your yeah. .com, yeah. reserve that. Even if you aren't ready to do your site yet, lock it up before somebody else takes your name or your title or whatever you want. Make it memorable, make it easy to remember. Um, if you can get your name, get your name. Easy to spell. Too. Uh, easy to spell. Um, the weirder it is, the harder it will be for people to remember. Um, and WordPress makes a great website. Uh, that means that it is easy to customize for you. It's easy for you to update. You don't have to pay somebody to do uh, every little change you want on your website because it's really an awful lot like posting to Facebook. I, I actually really recommend Squarespace if you're not technical. Um, I love WordPress and I've used it since 2004, mm -hmm. but if you're at all like not a tech person, something that is hosted completely by another platform like Squarespace or even Wix or Weebly can be a lot easier yeah, for somebody hey. who's not... And Clarification, and Wix is stupid, simple to use. I love it. SEO value, from what I've been told for a couple of years now, is garbage. Yeah, there, um, there are ways to work with both Wix and Weebly in terms of SEO, yeah. if you know what yeah. it is. They, they fixed a couple yeah, of things on Wix in the last year or so. Yeah. And there's videos to show you about the SEO for both of them. On the side note, dropping off your books at the library is good. Drop them off at the jails. Those people can't get out. Yes. Uh, well, and they also, cannot choose. They have very little choices on what they can read. And yeah. mail them to overseas to our troops. I, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Was overseas to troops Question? because those yeah. guys, yeah. you know, the and ladies. Hey, the guys and the that's ladies are sitting there something. and they are desperate oh, for means. something to consume. And I have been told that a, you know, Where they they will book? read books out of order in a series because it's what came through, and those books will get passed around until the covers fall off. Now you may not have made any money on those books. But when they come home, they will look you up. Or they'll write home to mom and say, can you send me, I'm missing book two, five, and seven. <laughs> or they'll replace them because they passed the book on and they don't have it anymore. A lot of them are actually romance readers, too. I found out listening to uh, author Christine Feehan a few years ago when she was sending over her books from one of the PSYOPs series. They were loving it because they were, it was what her husband does or did for a while, not the fly out part, but um, yeah. But that was interesting just to note. Um, had a question? Okay, you guys talked about um, WordPress, Wix, and Squarespace. How would you rate Blogger as a website platform? Great, that's One what we're of the things of. to pay attention to are those terms of service. And s many of the blogging platforms will prohibit commercial activity. LiveJournal doesn't want your commercial activity, for example. 
Um, so don't build some place where they can knock you off for breaking your terms of service. WordPress is just fine with commercial activity, and if you are promoting and selling a book, it is commercial activity. And, uh, and, and again, this is the, the business side coming out and, and being the tech guy. I build what I want to own. It's mine. I, you know, my own domains. I do use a lot of WordPress, but it's put on my own hosting, my own domains, all the rest of that. Uh, when I build mailing lists, when I build all of that, it's mine. It's my data. Nobody can ever take it from me. And so it, it takes a little bit more investment. But when you're going to a Wix or one of these guys, you're locked into their platform. I'm not locked into anybody at all. I have my data. I have everything else. And it is mine. Although it, there's important to, there's two different types of WordPress. There's WordPress.com, which right. is more yes. like a blogger that's hosted by them, and then there's WordPress.org, which is the software that you then have to host on your own hosting platform. Right? You can yes, thank you. .com and it's perfectly free, and they take care of everything. Like well, so but you're limited. Okay. Your, your domain name at WordPress.com, WordPress unless you want to spend like I think 13 bucks a year. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But there's also still limitations on plugins and things like that you can plug into it. Yeah, and, and let me throw one more piece out there that kind of goes along with owning your own domain, domain, domain name, and that is buy your ISBNs from Bowker. Don't get them free from CreateSpace because it, when you scroll down that page and you look at who published it, that ISBN shows up as CreateSpace as the publisher, not you, not your name, and it's just right or wrong that will be a red flag for some people that this is not a truly professional work so that is one place to fork over some money and you don't have to buy a big block of ISBNs but throw down you know a couple hundred and and get your ISBNs from Bauer. I would uh, having been in the web hosting business um, definitely own the domain Make sure you are the registrant, not your web designer owning the domain, uh, which they say, I'll do it for you and you know you don't worry, about it. but they own the domain, not you. Make sure you're the registrant on the Whois data. And use an email at your domain, not Jimbo, jimbob at gmail.com. Use it at jimbobauthor.com uh, and uh, Anyway, uh, I've seen at least two cases where people said, well, I'm going to register X domain in some public meeting, and then someone at that public meeting went on and registered the domain. Uh, so don't tell people beforehand that you're going to register X domain, or you'll find it's been registered by somebody else. There are domain websites that you can bid for the domains. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So on that topic, when you go start researching your domain names, you know what you want. Be prepared to buy it then because what it does is when you make the queries to your domain names or the things you want to search, those queries then trigger other systems that are looking at queries for this and they'll go out and bid or and or buy and jack it up and so then all of a sudden you're like, oh crud, it was available 10 minutes ago. An hour later you come back and somebody's just bought it because. Uh, like they were saying, HostGator, GoDaddy, things like that. When you buy a domain name through them, they own the domain name, and then they charge you to use it. And the web host, not as a domain registrar, right. GoDaddy reseller. And uh, if you buy the domain through uh, the reg them as a registrar, rather it's a hosting service, you own the domain. But it's it, a little See, because I own all three of my domains for the other for a side project, but I bought them through HostGator. Actually, My information's on the, on the... What he's talking about is called front-running, and there were a number of outfits that were doing that. Somebody would query over domain, and then they pass it on to somebody, and they, somebody else would register it. Uh, that's considered um, borderline illegal and fraud, uh, but it certainly happened in the past, and probably it still happens. I, I'm going to say... I'm going to suggest, and, and this is just me, I get no affiliate, no none of the fun stuff. I use Namecheap.com. I've used Namecheap for years for buying domains, and all I do through, through, from them is buying my domains. 
Um, I use Bluehost for most of my hosting. I, I do some blue or I use a couple of other hosting services as well, but I do use Bluehost. Again, I get no affiliate, no nothing from them, um, but I can I, I entirely keep those things separate. Um, you kind of mentioned Google earlier, and just sort of like the ways Google can bite you in the ass. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you specifically referring to, and things to watch out for if that's not too large a topic? <laughs> um, that can be a very large topic, but as a general rule, um, so Google changes their algorithm every, I mean, almost every day. Um, part of which is dynamic, part, part of which is organic growth and what they do. So sometimes you don't necessarily know why something changed other than the system said, huh, this is interesting, this is trending up, this is trending down, or it triggers a rule. Other times it is because something is brought up or raised from a social perspective that somebody wants to encourage or discourage. Um, and then Google also, again, is a business. They want to get your money. If they register the fact that you're a commercial enterprise, um, much like any other social media platform, uh, they, they want to get advertising dollars from you. They want you to pay to help boost. They will show you, oh, I'm sponsored content versus not. But there's also other things where if you are a, you know, if you are buying and paying for Google services or doing other connections to, see, yes, if you're going through Google and some of the other services, Google will recognize the fact that, hi, yes, we do business with you, so we're also going to give you some more preferential treatment. Um, uh, yeah, and and it's money. Follow the money. It was every 60 for a while, and that's yeah. coming from the adult community that told me this a couple years ago. It's also it's important to note that everybody's search engine results are going to be different because they're customizing it based on your browser history and all sorts of stuff. One of the main things that's really shifted in the last couple of years is the shift towards mobile first as far as the search. So if you have a website that is not mobile friendly, not responsive, which means like you put it on your phone mm -hmm. and suddenly it shifts to fit, you're going to be dinged further and further down in the search results. So that's why you know having a website that looks good on every device is really, really important. And but it and yeah yeah they're different. There's different templates for all of them that can be mobile friendly or not. So just make sure you're using one that's but mobile friendly. The the only other thing I'd add for Google and and because again I do a lot of speaking about data privacy, personal privacy, and is go and take a brand new machine and take it to a coffee shop or wipe you know wipe a laptop throw something on it and take it to a coffee shop that has no indicators on it about you at all and start googling a couple of things but it does not take them very long to figure out who you are who what your house is and take a very clean machine and start to all of a sudden target you with all sorts of marketing and information um, I have I have friends that do a number of different podcasts, and, and I contribute to some of this. I contribute to some articles. So when I start getting into, you know, researching some very niche topics, sometimes that are a little bit interesting, um, the stuff you start getting marketed to you when, when, when it's time for the annual poop review in the year, and you start getting advertising for Depends Diapers. Um, Google will lock down and figure out who you are. What are all of your mobile devices? What are your laptops? What are your computers in your house? What are all the devices in your house? You, and if you start doing things like Alexa, you start doing, you know, Amazon does the same exact thing. They figure out exactly who you are. Your digital profile. I, I've got a story with that. You know, again, I, with the stuff I Google, I'm sure I'm on a number of lists in Washington. <laughs> Um, and probably elsewhere, but you know, I was looking up. Um, I write a lot about the supernatural, the occult, paranormal, I necromancers, lots of vampires, and I was looking something up on vampire lore. And the next time I log into Google, I get this sponsored ad in the the right hand side: "Looking for vampires? Target has them, thirty percent off." <laughs> And I'm going, okay, wow, I missed yeah. that the last time I was a target. Yeah. But they'll suck you dry. <laughs> All right, folks, um, I'm guessing it's 1230, so, yeah. okay, cool, cool. It is indeed. I've got a couple books up here for sale. Okay, one's yeah. already taken. I have one book up here for sale. So <laughs>
Come on up. Can you get a round of applause for my panelists, please? Um. And, uh, and I'm I've not seeing him, but my man Scott in the EFF track. Oh. Okay. And thank you. And I, I've got books, but I also have cards. The blog is up. The first book in the series comes out later this year. There'll be podcasts, there'll be video series, and everything else if you're looking for the business side of, of being an author.